Hey guys, ever notice how Michael Buble pops his head out of the ground every December trying to sell his Christmas albums? Well, Uranium Bulls basically do the same thing every year in January. They pop out of Twitter and they start telling us all that this is the year that Uranium makes its comeback. They say a broken clock is right twice a day and oh baby, I think we've reached that time of day for Uranium. It's time to start snorting that yellow cake because Uranium is back baby. But before I get started, I need you to call your brother, your mom, your dad, your sister's ex-boyfriend's cousin. I don't care. You need to tell them to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell because Small Cap Steve is about to go nuclear. Okay, folks, in case you're new to uranium, here's what you need to know. Uranium is a heavy metal, so heavy that it actually sometimes gets used as keels of yachts and as counterweights for aircraft control surfaces. It is the key to nuclear power generation. It is 18.7 times as dense as water, has a melting point of 1132 degrees Celsius, and is primarily found in Australia, Kazakhstan, and Canada. The big takeaway if you're looking at investing in uranium and nuclear power is that it could be our ticket to a carbon neutral future. Don't believe me? Just ask Bill Gates or Elon Musk. Nuclear power is the only carbon free energy source we have that can deliver large amounts of power day and night through every season, almost anywhere on Earth. And it's been proven to work on a large scale. Yeah, but I think the hydro, especially existing hydro, is, is good for mining. Geothermal, there's lots of places in the world that have geothermal energy. Nuclear is also good. Uranium is beloved by retail investors for the simple reason that it has the ability to go parabolic. The annual production sits around 125 million pounds of uranium with annual demand around 190 million pounds. Priced in today's dollar at $50 per pound, it puts annual demand around eight and a half billion dollars. So based on our research, we can find articles dating back to the early 1950s where uranium investors held the metal with expectations of massive returns. Over the last 70 years, we've seen various booms and busts with the most recent bull cycle occurring from 2004 to mid 2007, where we saw the price rally from around $15 to a high of 136. The price then settled in nicely around 40 to $50, which was followed by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in March, 2011, which saw Japan, who at the time had 54 nuclear reactors operating, electing to shut down the vast majority of them with only 10 reactors active today. The price of uranium then sank to a low of just under $20 in 2016. With only 443 nuclear reactors active today around the world, we can see how a country with just 50 reactors can have a massive impact on the supply and demand balance for the uranium market. But after 14 years of endless hoping, it appears the uranium bulls time may have finally come again. At the time of filming, the yellow metal is currently trading around $50, up over 80% since a one-year low of $27.60, and it appears the momentum is just beginning. So speaking back to fundamentals here, the largest piece of the global nuclear power demand is the United States, who has 94 nuclear reactors operating with two more under construction and three more planned. Now, notably, second place is China, with 49 operating reactors, 16 under construction, and 39 more planned. Japan's kind of the odd one in this story, where we've got an election coming up where Prime Minister candidate Tara Kono, who leads polling to win the popular vote, generally wants Japan off nuclear power. But in the same breath, he also says he wants to ramp it up to avoid coal, creating some medium-term demand for the yellow powdery stuff. Reuters has him quoted saying, what I've been saying about an exit from nuclear power is decommissioning quickly nuclear power plants that are reaching retirement and gradually exiting nuclear energy. As I explained before, we should stop the use of coal, increase energy conservation and renewable energy, and nuclear power can be used to fill the gap. Fundamentally, things are shaping up nicely for uranium. But what's behind the sudden squeeze? So it all started in March 2021. Denison Mines, operator of the underdevelopment Wheeler River project in Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin, announced that they plan to raise US $75 million in a bot deal financing, the proceeds of which would be used to purchase uranium from the spot market for keeping it in a strategic reserve. As Deep Dive contributor Braden Mack tells us at the time, a mining company purchasing reserves of its main product is rare. The object of the mining business being generally to turn the commodity into cash and not the other way around. But Denison clearly knows its audience who responded favorably with an oversubscription to the deal, which was closed this past Monday, March 22nd, bringing gross proceeds of $86.27 million. And then suddenly the bat signal goes off at Sprott Asset Management headquarters in July when they announced the creation of the first ever physical uranium trust, allowing retail investors an opportunity to directly drive investment demand in physical uranium via the stock market. Now our old friends over at Wall Street Bets catch on and suddenly we got ourselves an old fashioned rally. 
the annual spot market of around 100 million pounds or around 3 billion US dollars wouldn't take much buying beyond what Denison pulled earlier to make sparks fly on the spot market. The Sprott Physical Uranium Trust started in July when uranium was priced around $32. As its name suggests, the fund was established to hold physical uranium, specifically U308, providing investors direct exposure to the physical asset. The fund is listed on the TSX under the symbol U.UN and is expected to get a US big board listing at a later date. The trust was established as a closed ended fund. Now, this is important. It means that unlike an ETF, when investors sell off the fund, Sprott does not have to sell uranium to fund the outflows, meaning it stays in the vaults and does not hit the markets. As one Reddit user put it, it makes the fund structurally diamond handed. The fund started out at a relatively decent size, $600 million. Not bad for a new trust, but they wanted more, much, much more. So how do they grow their assets under management? Well, the trust has taken an easy path for this. To enable new unit creation, they use something called an ATM or an at the market financing meaning they sell new units on the open market, in this case, whenever the value of the unit is above the net asset value for current units. Any proceeds raised from the ATM financing goes directly to the purchase of more physical uranium. But here's where it gets interesting. The first ATM announced by the trust began on August 17th, the most recent low for uranium. At that time, Sprott announced that the trust would be conducting a US $300 million financing to fund further uranium purchases. By the end of August, AUM had grown from $600 million to $754 million, with the trust holding $741 million worth of uranium, or roughly enough uranium to power all of France for 10 months. So as the momentum continues, well, the ATM suddenly fills. So what does Sprott do? They go back for more, announcing a second ATM financing, this time to the tune of US $1 billion. Well, why is this substantial? Other than the fact that it's a billion dollars. As of the day of the announcement, the entire fund itself had assets under management of US 1.13 billion. That means that they're looking to quickly double the value of all uranium it holds in physical trust. A billion dollars at $50 per pound represents around 20% of the world's annual production. And at this rate, Sprott appears to be filling these ATMs in a matter of weeks. So what happens if we get to the point where Sprott is buying up uranium to the tune of 100 to 125 million pounds a year? If that happens, there goes annual supply and who knows where the price ends up. So if you're catching on here, you're realizing that the uranium market is small, very small. Current production is estimated at a little over 125 million pounds per year, while demand is estimated at being 190 million pounds for 2021. At $30 uranium, that's roughly a $5.7 billion market, which is wild given the supply and demand imbalance. There are literally cannabis stocks valued higher than the entire uranium market right now. What's also valued higher? Why GameStop, of course, and look at the number that Wall Street bets did to that stock. On that topic, roughly two months ago, Uranium had its roaring kitty moment on Wall Street bets in the form of a user named Rad the Reptile. The user published a post titled The Uranium Thesis, Have Your Cake, But Don't Eat It, which is viewed as one of the origins of the rising demand for the metal. The post outlined many facets of the market, including the rising demand for clean nuclear energy, how it's used, and the commodity market behind the metal, including the involvement of hedge funds, one key point is that until we reach 50 to $60 per pound uranium, mines are unlikely to start up, causing a further supply glut. While specific stocks were not mentioned, it began a chain of events. As small cap investors know, sentiment is everything. So where is uranium headed? Well, if Sprott's activities are any indication, it's higher. One Twitter user who has been notably on the money with several uranium price calls, Nambro Kevin, was expecting the metal to hit $55 per pound by year end. However, earlier this week, he said this target will likely get blown away. He's also suggested that $180 per pound might be achieved by March 2022. And of course, as one would expect, Buying but gets buying, and we're now seeing copycat funds partake in the uranium squeeze, with Uranium Royalty Corp announcing they acquired an additional 648,000 pounds of physical uranium. Okay, so here are the key takeaways I want you to think about when you're watching this. First, you got to think about how nuclear is the key to a carbon neutral future. Then you're going to think about how nuclear requires uranium. Thirdly, you're going to think about how the uranium market is a very small market. Next, you're going to think about how uranium had the introduction of its first physical ETF in July of 2021. And 
Next, you're going to think about how this event has made the price of the commodity increase by 80% since its inception two and a half months ago. Lastly, you're going to think about how the momentum is getting stronger and stronger and how this social media movement keeps growing. What happens next? Well, that's anyone's guess. But my God, we may have ourselves an old fashioned uranium squeeze. And this time, instead of squeezing the hedges, we're squeezing the utilities. So if you liked our explainer on the current uranium market, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so that I can buy deep dive contributor young Justin tickets to the Grey Cup at Tim Hortons Field in Hamilton. All right. Thank you, everybody.